One of the reasons that we like computers is that they're good at doing the tedious, repetitive stuff for us. So now it's time to learn about a way of making computers repeat themselves. So here's a simple example. Let's suppose you have a variable n, which is set to zero. And what we're going to do is repeat until n reaches a certain value. So we start with the word while, and then we give a condition while n is less than 15. What's going to happen is that when it reaches this line, Ruby will evaluate this condition. Is n less than 15? Going into it, it's 0, so that's, that will be true. And it will execute the lines in the middle of the loop. So the first thing we're going to do is add 1 to whatever's in n and store it back. And we're going to print out that many monkeys and the end statement closes the loop. So these two lines will execute over and over, and after each one it will check this condition. Once the condition becomes false, it will stop. So we get one monkey on the first line, all the way down to 15 monkeys at the end, and n is now equal to 15. So that's one way of looping. Here's a slightly different example. Suppose we have Fred, George, Barney in a list. Uh, there's a method on arrays to check whether there are any elements at all in the array. It's called empty with a question mark on the end. So this array is not empty because it has three things in it. This array is empty, so that will return true. One other thing, there's a not operator which is simply the logical negation of the boolean value. Not false is true, not true is false. So this allows us to write while not names empty and with a little interpolation names shift takes the first name off the front and it prints once for each name, Fred, George, Barney. With a slightly different syntax, there's another word, until, which is exactly like while, except that it reverses it. So now we can write until names empty, which is a little bit more natural. And it produces the same result. Now, a couple of more things. There's a handy function that allows you to check whether something is nil. For example, the string is not nil. Empty array is not nil. False is not nil. But nil is nil. That's the only value that produces a true from this. Another thing that we need is globals, because we have these scoping rules. Just for the moment, we're going to take advantage of the fact that if you declare a variable with a dollar sign on the left, Ruby allows that variable to be accessed and available anywhere in your code. It doesn't have to participate in scoping rules. Other than that, it's a variable like any other, and there's nothing else special about it. You don't want to use these very often because there are only so many names and if somebody else decides to call their variable the same thing, it's going to create a lot of confusion. But for our purposes, this is convenient right now. So we're going to start by creating a global variable called fibs. And we're going to assign it an array with 0 and 1 as the starter values. If you remember your Fibonacci sequence, each number in the Fibonacci sequence is the sum of the two preceding numbers. So here's how we can do this. We're going to have a while loop. We'll check whether the particular Fibonacci number that the person is looking for is in the array or not. Recall that if you try to access past the end of the array, you get back nil. So if they're trying to access a Fibonacci number that we haven't figured out yet, 
this will be true. In which case, we'll use the double left angle bracket operator and add something to the end of the array. There's another nice feature of arrays, which is you can count from the end instead of from the, from the beginning by using a negative number. So this is the last element in the array, and this is the second last. So we're adding together the two last elements in this array and tacking the result on to the end. So we keep doing that until the element that they're looking for becomes available because we just figured out what it is. And then we return it. So if we load that, and we say Fibonacci 0, we get the first one. 1, we get 1. If we ask for 2, that's also 1. 3 is 2. 4 is 3. 5 is 5. This should be a familiar sequence. What's happening is that these are being built up in this array fibs. Every time we ask for one that we don't have, we don't have to ask for them in order. We can jump ahead to 20 or 100 and we get the right answer every time.